Well, good evening and uh, welcome to the June 8th meeting of the uh, City of Salem Urban Renewal Agency and City of Council. Uh, we're going to begin uh, calling to order the Urban Renewal Agency. If the uh, recorder would please call the roll. Board Member Kayser. Present. Board Member Anderson. Here. Board Member Nakey. Here. Board Member Leung. Here. Board Member Osik. Here. Board Member Hoy. Here. Board Member Nordyke. Here. Board Member Lewis. Here. And Chair Bennett. Here. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Okay, approval of additions and deletions. Do we have any, Councillor Hoy? No, we do not, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Uh, the consent calendar then. I move approval of the consent calendar. Second. Second by Kayser. And the consent calendar includes item 2.1A, the draft May 26, 2020 Urban Renewal Agency minutes. Item 2.3A, a, a funding for a state street two-way conversion project. And that concludes the consent calendar. Great, right. just a simple yay on the two-waying of State Street. That's been going on for a long time. Just glad to see it moving forward. So thank you. Uh, all those in favor of the uh, motion, say aye. No, that's right. We're going to do a roll call. Okay. You Board guys just don't want to make it easy, do you? <laughs> Board Member Nakey. Aye. Board Member Kayser. Aye. Board Member Osik. Aye. Board Member Hoy. Aye. Board Member Nordyke. Aye. Board Member Lewis. Aye. Board Member Leung. Aye. Board Member Anderson. Aye. And Chair Bennett. Aye. All right. Motion passes. Uh, we have a public hearing on the uh, 2021 Salem Urban Renewal Agency budget. The He's urban. Gonna, oh. gonna lead our. Uh, the Urban Renewal go. Agency will now hold a public hearing regarding the, the fiscal year 2021 budget. The hearing will begin with a staff presentation. Good evening, Mayor Bennett and board members. I'm Josh Eggleston, the city's budget officer. The Urban Renewal Agency Budget Committee recommended a budget to the agency board on May 13, 2020. The agency board is required to hold a public hearing on the recommended budget in compliance with state public budget law and the governor's executive order 20-16 this evening's public hearing was noticed on the city's website on may 29th 2020 there has not been any public comment received on the ura budget following the public hearing staff recommends the urban renewal agency board deliberate on the budget committee recommended budget and direct staff to return on june 22nd 2020 with a resolution to adopt the fiscal year 2021 Urban Renewal Agency budget. At that meeting, staff may request the agency board to amend the fiscal year 2021 budget approval made this evening to include any rebudgeted purchase orders or carryover projects from the fiscal year 2020 budget, which staff are currently identifying. Thank you. Hey, uh, Councillor Hoy, do you want to make the motion to kick us off? I move we direct staff to return on June 22nd, 2020 with a resolution to adopt the budget committee recommendation recommendation. I'm sorry, the budget committee's recommended fiscal year 2021 urban renewal agency budget. Second. Second by uh, Nordyke. Okay, any, uh, any discussion? Okay, uh, would you please call the roll, Madam Recorder? If we could close the hearing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you didn't hear my bang. <laughs> there, the hearing's closed. All right. It, board member Kayser. Aye. Board member Osik. Board member Hoy. Aye. And that was Osik. Board member, uh, he did say aye. Board member Nordyke. Aye. Board member Lewis. Aye. Board member Leung. Aye. Board member Anderson. Aye. Board member Nanke. Aye. And Chair Bennett. Aye. Motion passes. Okay. I don't see any further business for the Urban Renewal Agency, so we are adjourned.
And we'll call then this meeting of the Salem City Council for June 8th to order. Uh, if the uh, recorder would please call the roll. Councillor Kayser? Present. Councillor Anderson? Likewise. Councillor Nakey? Here. Councillor Leung? Here. Councillor Osik? Councillor Hoy? Here. Councillor Nordyke? Here. Councillor Lewis? Here. And we'll go back to Councillor Osik? And Mayor Bennett? Here. Yeah. We'll move to uh, any additions or deletions, Councillor Hoy? Mr. Mayor, I move approval of the additions and deletions to the agenda. Second. Which Second by Kayser. Any discussion? Just, it just consists of written testimony received to date. Right. Okay. Councilor Nordyke? Uh, yes, I have an agenda item that I would like to add later on under special items. And I don't know if I want to do that now or later, but I am interested in adding an item to our agenda under special orders of business later this evening. Well, why don't we hear your motion and maybe we should just add it at this point since we're at additions and deletions. Thank you, why Mayor. You Thank you. My motion is to direct staff to provide an overview and to provide uh, information on diversity, equity, and training as part of new city councilor orientation. The intention of that motion, and I'll stop there because I know the whole point is to have the motion and then you explain later. Sure. Second. Second. Councilor Hoy. Okay. Go ahead and explain. It, it seems really great idea. Go great. ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Bennett, uh, in order to see the need for change, you have to understand the need for change. And we know because of the protests that we have seen that Salem is calling out for change, calling out for an improved communications between institutions of power and marginalized communities. And one of the ways we do that is we educate decision makers on how to understand the importance of change. Uh, I know from serving in other leadership capacities that diversity and equity training can and should be a best practice for decision makers. And I'm asking that we join the ranks of other institutions who have diversity and equity and inclusion training incorporated into new member orientation materials for all city incoming new city councilors. And to ensure that everyone is on the same page, I would like all city council members, not just new ones to participate. And I would like Salem department heads to participate because a lot of decisions are made that impact communities of color and other marginalized communities that don't even rise to the level of council consideration. So my intention would be to direct staff, and I want to work with staff on this to help identify training that would be suitable for this body and to, in, to implement that training uh, when the new city councilors start having their new member orientation. That is my motion. Very good. Councilor Anderson, did I see your hand? Yes, you did. I, I'm in favor of this motion, but I just want to make sure that we don't need to first to suspend the rules uh, uh, in order to pass it. I don't know if that's a question for the city attorney and then I have another comment too. So the motion can be raised at uh, tonight's meeting, but uh, because it wasn't submitted earlier, it can't be voted on unless you vote to suspend the rules and that requires a two thirds majority. I move we suspend the rules to uh, uh, consider the motion. Second. Second by Leo. Okay, let's, uh, let's take the rule suspension first. Uh, anyone have any discussion on that, or can we go to a vote? Hey, if the clerk or if the uh, recorder would please call the roll. Councillor Lewis? Aye. Councillor Kayser? Aye. Councillor Anderson? Aye. Councillor Nanke? Aye. Councillor Leung? Aye. Councillor Osik? Councillor Hoy? Aye. Councillor Nordyke? Aye. And is Councillor Osik available? Is he with us? Okay, Mayor Bennett. Aye. 
Okay, motion passes, we suspend the rules, and now we can go uh, to the motion to get it to the uh, special order business. Yes, thank you, Councilor Anderson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I had uh, 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 I had my blinker on before Councilor Nordyke finished all her um, presentation, but I think her motion was just for new counselors. And so I think we, uh, I make an amendment to, to the motion to include current counselors and uh, city department heads. Do former counselors too? I think Councilor <laughs> Nordyke really <laughs> pretty well explained what she's looking for. Do you I feel like that, you'd like to have it included? I think the motion was just for incoming counselors and I think it ought to be brought. All counselors sounds good. Councilor uh, Nanke. Thank you. Do you have a second? Yeah. And I would, no, I actually just wanted to have the motion. Let me make sure Tom has a second. Just second, so. second. Second by Leo. Okay, go ahead, I Councilor Nanke. Yeah, I just wanted. wanted I think the original motion already included that. It well, it, it, it didn't. And I hear what he's saying. He'd like to have, it's. I think it was the intent of the motion and oh, Councilor yeah. Nordyke explained it very well. I think Tom's just trying to codify it. You know make what, sure everybody me. does. Yeah. I, I'm sure Councillor Nordyke has no objections. So I, I think that's what's going on. Yeah. And can we restate the entire motion then? Well, the motion well, right now as is- As well as amended? Yeah. Just so we know what we're moving on to special orders of business? All right. What's so the amendment, Tom? My amendment is that Councillor Nordyke's motion be amended to include uh, um, all present city councilors as well as incoming councilors and to include all department heads of the city. So that'll be our first vote. And then Councillor Nordyke will explain the larger motion now that includes everybody. Go ahead, Councillor. Sure. No, I have nothing further to add. Okay. I'm ready to make... vote if others are too. Thank you. Is that satisfactory, Councillor Nanke? Well, I, I didn't hear what the main motion is that we just amended. That's what I think about. The main motion was simply to make sure that change begins. We know that we have an incoming class of new city councilors, and that to me struck me as the right time to have diversity and equity inclusion training. As we have new people coming on board, that strikes me as the best opportunity for all of us to begin this training. And I, you know, long term, I would like to see this happen That's not a motion. every time. No. Every she, time we have a new incoming class of so city her council. motion is uh, uh, the equity and what else training, equity, training. Equity, inclusion training, the original training for that. all incoming and currently yeah. serving city councilors as well as city staff. Yeah, department heads. Yes, department heads rather. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? And we're going to set up a special order in the business section of the meeting. Right. Okay. But on this Mr. motion Mayor, right now, to get it there. You got any problem or any questions? Mr. Mayor, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Mr. Mayor? And now, Matt. Go okay. Ahead. Thank you. You're working on a technical issue. Yeah, I understand. Okay. Let's, you ready to vote on this? Do you, do you follow the motion, Matt? Yes, I just couldn't get it to hear me. Oh, okay. Our, our, excuse me, a point we'll of order. We're, we're voting on the motion to amend Councilor yep. Nordyke's motion, and then that's right. That's okay. right. Okay. That's right. Well, should we on uh, Anderson's amendment, I'll, uh, we'll uh, do a roll call. Okay, Councilor Kayser. Aye. Councilor Anderson. Aye. Councilor Nanke. Aye. Councilor Leung? Aye. Councilor Osik? Aye. Councilor Hoy? Aye. Councilor Nordyke? Aye. Councilor Lewis? Aye. And Mayor Bennett? Aye. Okay, motion, the amendment passes. Uh, we'll now go to the uh, amended motion by Councilor Nordyke. Are there any, is there any discussion or comments? This is just to move it to special orders of business, okay? We're suspending the rules to get it to special orders of business. Okay, let's do a roll call then. Councilor Anderson. Aye. Councilor Nanke. Aye. Councilor Leung. Aye. Councilor Osik. Aye. Councilor Hoy. Aye. 
Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Lewis. Aye. Councillor Kayser. Aye. And Mayor Bennett. Aye. Okay, motion passes. We'll take it up under special orders of business then. Uh, council manager comments. I'd like to call on Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I had to unmute myself. And I'll just say by way of background, Councillor, um, Councillors Hoy and um, Kayser and I have come up with uh, a statement that we're each going to read part of and right. one enter in the record. So I'll go with the first two paragraphs. And who'll go, who'll go next, Hoy? Uh, yes, Hoy and Kayser last. You'll call on each other to kind of move your way through yes. this? Excellent, thank you. Um, the events of the past weeks, starting with the murder of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police, has, have exposed the excruciating scars in our nation from over 400 years of deeply ingrained, insidious, institutional racism. For too long have the scars been ignored by those of privilege. Salem, its institutions, and its people, especially its people of color, suffer from this plague of injustice. The protests of the last few weeks here in Salem are expressions of profound disagreement with and anguish for the way people of color have been treated by people in power. The overwhelming majority of people protesting in Salem have been peaceful and have every right under the First Amendment to assemble and petition their government to address their valid grievances. A very small group was not often committing and inciting acts of violence against the police and vandalism against downtown businesses and state buildings. Councilor Kayser or Councilor Hoy. Another small group of persons downtown at the behest of local business owners created a much more dangerous situation by their openly carrying weapons of assault and death. Placing the protection of property over life and attempting to elevate the Second Amendment to threaten harm to persons exercising their First Amendment rights. Although Oregon is an open carry state, we have to ask, does this blatant intimidation and threats contribute to peace and safety, advance the peaceful exercise of protest rights, calm the situation, or do just the opposite? Does the relatively minor property damage in downtown justify a pseudo-military presence in downtown Salem? Of course not. For the peace and security of Salem, put away your weapons. Make your point, not at the point of a gun. Policing is a very tough job. Police officers are subject to intense pressures in maintaining the peace, in confrontations with angry persons, in volatile situations, and in bringing justice for victims of crime. The circumstances surrounding the killing of Mr. Floyd have intensified emotions and actions. Like the protesters, the vast majority of the Salem Police Department have been professional, even-handed, and even-tempered, even tempered, and respectful in their interactions with the protesters. Unfortunately, police officers, just like all of us, are not perfect and do not always use appropriate language to defuse tense situations. This occurred in the police interaction with the gun-toting protesters in front of a private business. At Saturday's peaceful protest, attended by many members of this council, as well as thousands of others, Chief Moore apologized for the content of the message to the people with weapons downtown. We strongly encourage Chief Moore to ensure that the actions such as this do not occur again through a systematic review of policies and training that facilitate fairness, justice, and accountability. And we ask the city manager to ensure this occurs. Councilor Kayser. All of this points out what is needed in our city as well as in our country. We need more and better training for our peace officers in implicit bias and in ways to communicate with those in our community who have been denied their basic rights and humanity for too long because of the color of their skin. At the same time, our peace officers and our community must strive to send a clear message to the small segment of society that insists on promoting violence. We, as members of the city council, are ready to stand beside our community and our police department in this moment in history to ensure we learn, grow, evolve, and do better moving forward. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, you, you really uh, spoke to a whole range of issues that are troubling to all of us and to the community. So thank you very much, that was, that was really good. Uh, anyone else? Yes, Councillor Nordai. Uh, first of all, if there was a way to sign off on that letter along with my other counselors, I would be honored to do so. 
if there are other opportunities to make opening council remarks, I'd prefer to defer until others have had an opportunity to speak. But I want to give that presence and space and say thank you for saying that. And I would love to join in that letter and that statement. Thank you. So you don't have any comments? <laughs> I, in I do have comments in addition. Go ahead. Go ahead. If now's the right time, sure. sure. So, you know, um, it's hard for me to speak more eloquently than what was already said. So I will shorten my remarks accordingly. I can tell you that as one of several counselors and some, several members of our community who participated in the march this Saturday, there were thousands of people who were calling for change. And it is up to leadership at all levels, city, school board, countywide, statewide, and nationwide to respond accordingly to a way that ensures that we have equality and an end to police brutality. What I want to remind folks is that under our police department, the chokehold that was used in Minneapolis is already expressly prohibited. And I want everyone in the community to know that that has already been condemned by our chief of police and condemned, but frankly, by level-headed police officers and police chiefs around the country. That is completely unacceptable. And the vast majority of officers already know that. So know that that can never happen in Salem and will never happen in Salem, not under our watch. The other thing I would like everyone to know, for those who weren't able to brave the rain and the hail that was present at that march on Saturday, was that we had several members of our law enforcement agencies kneeling with us, standing with us, hugging other protesters. There is a real opportunity here to build better bridges, to build deeper lines of communication, so that we as a community, particularly persons of color in this community, can come to feel that it can't happen here. But we can't merely take assumptions, we can't merely take assurances. Now more than ever, transparency in policing and community-based policing is, is extremely important. We know from the success and the peacefulness of the protest on Saturday that when people work together, you can have peaceful assembly, which is something that is a deeply ingrained American value to peacefully assemble. The chief organizer for the Salem Saturday protest worked closely with law enforcement before the protest to ensure that we would have a peaceful protest on everything from what the route would look like, on rerouting the chariots buses, on making sure that folks could feel safe marching in the streets. And I was deeply moved to see so many downtown Salem businesses supportive of this protest. They had peaceful and supportive messages written in chalk and on their storefronts. And I want to say thank you to all the small businesses who, businesses who expressed solidarity with us and who donated time and supplies and goodwill we also had a number of faith leaders present at this protest from a variety of denominations. Peace is non-denominational. Non Peace is not racist. And I think that there are lots of things that we can do here in Salem to show that when it does come for demanding change, there are ways to do it that build bridges. And so I think moving forward, the public has a lot of questions questions that have been unearthed because of what happened in Minneapolis, questions about who and when are curfews determined, how are curfews decided, are they applied equally to everyone, and what about equipment that police use, what are, what are the trainings that they use. As I understand it, this was the first time in, pro uh, we, we had tear gas use for the first time perhaps ever in Salem's history. What are the protocols for when the police can and should deploy things like tear gas? As indicated in my peers' statement, I believe we do need a systematic review of policies and trainings that facilitate fairness, justice, and accountability. I think transparency is our best friend. 
in the cause of justice and peace and overcoming racism. We do this by talking together. We do this by having trainings together. We do this by listening to each other. And I feel that this council is prepared to do so. And I look forward to our new peers joining with us. And hopefully we can work together on that. Our work is far from done, but I'm encouraged. And we need to now take all of the goodwill that's being generated by the peaceful protests and turn it into action at every level of government. So I look forward to having those conversations with members of the community, with my peers on council, with the police department, and how we can make this uh, even more transparent. Another suggestion I would have once we've had an opportunity to hear more from the community is, have we thought about bringing more youth representation on board with groups like the Citizen Police Review Board? We saw a lot of young people turn out for these protests. They want to be heard. They want to be a part of the conversation. I think a simple way to increase their level of engagement is by ensuring that they have a seat at the table at the police review board. That's just one of the many things that we can do. I think whatever the next steps are, they need to be made with people of color in mind and with the police in mind. Our police know what our trainings and protocols are, and frankly, I do not. And so I want to learn from both our people of color and our police force on how we can ensure that we have good public safety that is equally accessible and fair to all. Thank you. Great, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Leung. Thank you, um, thank you, Mayor. So um, there's a statement I would like to be able to um, convey. Um, so on Saturday, I also attended the March for Floyd um, event. It was attended by at least 2,000 people. I listened to others. I was also invited to speak as the only person of color on the city council right now, there are no words I, I have to describe what it was like to be among the other organizers. Like other speakers, I spoke about injustices, not only for Floyd, but also for the numerous other black men, women, and children who were killed due to racism and police brutality. This event was an accumulation of gatherings all week in Salem and that also was occurring throughout the country. The proclamation that's gonna be read tonight is not enough if the words are not put into action. Our community is hurting and has been hurting. As counselors, we're elected by the people to represent the people. The proclamation provides pretty words on what we can do, yet does nothing to address what is going on outside of our homes, outside of council chambers. I wanna be able to bring up three motions that are upcoming June 22nd city council meeting. One of the first things that I have, I'm concerned with is public part, uh, participation. Um, since we have now, um, moved our meetings to Zoom remote access um, is impossible for, it's, it's not possible for our community to participate in these meetings. I've seen larger cities such as Los Angeles and I believe even Portland now have an opportunity for people to participate in remote meetings. I have asked in private emails and I'm asking this time on the record for the city to be able to open up meetings virtually for community to participate. As a city, we're obligated to ensure that people have their voices heard. Not everyone is able or comfortable submitting written testimony. Some people want to be heard in person. And again, we've been doing this for months now, and I want to make sure that our community is actually able to participate. I want to be able to ensure that whatever it looks like that staff are, are able to come back with us even on by June 22nd or if not by before then and update and how we can ensure that uh, our community is able to participate. Second, I want to be able to bring forth a motion at the upcoming meeting that would direct the city to seek the termination of the contract with Salem Kaiser School District for school resource officers. We have seen a significant, num there's been a significant number of research that mentions a presence of school resource officers increasing the criminalization of students of color, moving students faster into the school to prison pipeline. Instead, police who are neither trained or certified in counseling or social work carry on a traditional policing models, addressing perceived rowdiness and disorder threats and surveillance of school children. A report from the ACLU called the Bullies in Blue details how schools when staffed with police officers, administrators grow increasingly likely to 
defer to the SROs who then take a law enforcement approach instead of disciplining kids with punishment such as detention or in-school suspension. Again, one of the things that Councillor Nordyke had mentioned earlier was the uh, inclusion of uh, police uh, youth youth advisory boards within the police department when that might be another way to engage with our youth while getting them also outside of the schools. Another issue that I also wanted to bring up was um, something that Councillor Nordyke actually mentioned earlier about chokeholds um, being condemned and not being allowed in the city. In previous emails, I had asked the city and manager about a program called Eight Can't Wait. And I would like to be able to bring a motion at the upcoming June 22nd meeting to direct city staff to explore programs such as Eight Can't Wait to be able to, and for the city to consider joining the movement. Of cities in Oregon, only Portland participates in it. And of those eight areas of coverage, Portland is meeting five of the eight benchmarkers. After last weekend's events and from the ongoing concerns about holding police accountable, I think it would benefit Salem to have this. Doing so would hold police officers accountable and to improve public safety. So again, I would like to be able to bring forth that motion at our upcoming June 22nd meeting for eight can't wait. If we as city councilors in the state capitol, we need to be able to put our feet where our mouth is. Well, that doesn't say, that's, I didn't mean to say it like that. <laughs> We need to be able to, sure. to walk. You know what you mean. Uh, yes, you know what I mean by that. So. Yeah. <laughs> let's not do that part. So in other words, let's put forth what we're saying today into action to protect our communities. Good. Thank you very much. Anyone else? All righty. Uh, Mr. Manager. Councilor Rothen, sorry. Oh, Councilor I'm Rothen, sorry. I'd like to say something? Man. Okay. So I appreciate the comments that were put forward in the joint statement, and I wanted to add slightly to the detail of that general policy review and procedure review. And I appreciate everything that Councilors Nordic and Leong said as well, that um, in general, the review of policies is a good idea, but there is one particular area that I wanted to call out, which is um, the difference in how threats are assessed by the police. In one essence, a uh, group of protesters, largely peaceful, um, was treated uh, aggressively. One group who was intentionally meant to be intimidating was treated less aggressively. And I think what we need to understand is why threats are assessed differently in the city of Salem and address that because the vigilantism that has been seen in downtown Salem by armed men carrying heavy weapons is different than a peaceful protest with arms when they specifically call out the intention to fight back. And one of the things that has been called out specifically by our small business owners downtown was that they felt much safer hearing that a few people with non-lethal weapons were going to march around downtown and potentially create property damage was much less threatening than hearing a bunch of people with heavily armed weapons we're going to be marching around downtown defending anyone against that kind of graffiti or small property crime and i want to emphasize how important it is to weigh the values of the community which should be to protect life and liberty less than property and that is the underlying value that I think that a lot of these protests are meant to address and that is sorely lacking in our threat assessment by police here in Salem and elsewhere. So yes, in general, we need to review the policies and procedures, but very specifically, how do we calculate the use of force? When to intervene versus when to say, these people are largely doing minimalistic interference in the community uh, versus people who are actually threatening the lives of community members. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Councilor or uh, City Manager Powers. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, clearly, the, the city has 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 work to do as the events over the past ten days uh, indicate. I, I've asked Chief Moore uh, tonight to provide a brief update to Council as 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 we will be bringing further information and updates to to council and the community. So if, if Chief Moore could provide please uh, a brief a brief update for council this evening. Thank you, City Manager Powers, Mayor, City Council, Jerry Moore, uh, your Chief of Police. Um, as you know, we've had an interesting uh, 10 days here in Salem uh, since the uh, horrific uh, incident in Minnesota. And uh, certainly that is being felt all over this nation and uh, clearly in Salem as well. Uh, you are probably well aware if you read the newspapers that uh, there were a variety of marches and protests over the last uh, 10 days, uh, beginning on Friday the 29th. Um, some of them have been uh, peaceful. Some of them have been um, a little more antagonistic and um, we have been present uh, throughout all of those uh, in, in some form or another. Uh, the, obviously, uh, on Saturday night, uh, the 30th, I believe it was, um, there was a, uh, uh, a protest and a march, if you will, uh, that was uh, originated on social media and uh, designed for everyone to meet at 10 p.m. Uh, on Saturday night. Um, I, will, uh, I will just summarize that uh, that group marched throughout the city, uh, the police assisting them by blocking traffic and directing them uh, in certain areas where they wanted to go or back to the Capitol building. At one point, uh, they tried to get back into the downtown area where we um, uh, stop them from moving farther into town for a variety of reasons, uh, which included the concern that uh, property damage and other issues. And at that point, we were met with um, rocks and bottles and bricks and uh, uh, mortar fireworks, uh, at which time we responded uh, with flashbangs and tear gas to try and control the crowd, uh, ultimately uh, breaking that group up. Uh, about 2.30 in the morning, I believe it was. No arrests were made. Uh, Saturday, Sunday, the, uh, the next day, uh, we also had demonstrations. Uh, on that particular day, uh, a group was in town and um, uh, took over a on-ramp on the Marion Street Bridge, uh, blocking that. Uh, they also marched to the um, Capitol building where they sat or laid in on Court Street, blocking... Uh, uh, the entire uh, inner uh, the entire street for a considerable amount of time uh, and then later on marched through town uh, again uh, armed with uh, uh, devices that they um, utilized against the police department uh, as they were marching and we also responded on that night. Uh, there were uh, 14 arrests made that night and um, uh, and then uh, on Monday, uh, the first, I believe it was, um, there was a peaceful march uh, uh, that uh, was organized by one of uh, the young men that lives in our community. And it was a uh, march from the uh, Capitol building to the new police facility. Um, the organizer worked with the uh, police department and we were able to uh, give them all of uh, Court Street, all of Liberty Street, all of High Street during their march. We controlled traffic and blocked intersections for them. Uh, and it was a very uh, positive event uh, uh, attended by many. And um, at the conclusion of that, the majority of the people left, but a few people stuck around. And uh, there were again, incidents of street blocking uh, and uh, other issues. And um, I believe eight people were arrested uh, that evening about 1.30 or 1 in the morning or so. Uh, Tuesday through Saturday was uh, very similar to the earlier event on Monday. Um, organizers met with the police. We worked on uh, plans for their marches and protests. Uh, we helped them um, with whatever they needed to, to do. 
and they were all peaceful. And um, uh, it was a, uh, I think they were all good events for this community, which uh, where they allowed people to uh, speak their voice and talk about their frustrations and their anger, uh, but no uh, violence broke out. The difference between uh, the Saturday, Sunday and the, the late night Monday event were that organizers who cared about peaceful protests were involved. Uh, they took care of business. Those that came to um, uh, march and uh, do things uh, that were violent or um, that were something that the organizers didn't want were advised that they really didn't want them there. And in, uh, I think most of those people left. So uh, our tradition of working with organizations or organizers in uh, helping them with marches and protests continued on those days and will continue in the future uh, when people are interested in uh, trying to do that. Um, we are well aware that there were uh, armed people in the downtown area for a considerable amount of time. Uh, ultimately, we were able to um, uh, persuade that, uh, that group of people that it was not their job to protect parts of the city, it was our job. And uh, through uh, discussion, uh, they recognized uh, that um, uh, they were not wanted there and uh, they left. Uh, I will tell you, they caused uh, considerable concern for members of this community. Um, uh, people were intimidated by it and people were afraid of it. And uh, we uh, certainly um, uh, tried to communicate that information to them. And ultimately they uh, did leave the Salem area and have not been back since. As far as our actions uh, that occurred in the last 10 days, I will tell you that uh, it is our intent to, um, and I'll address uh, some of uh, Councilor Osik's concern, it is our intent to uh, review uh, and do after action reports on all of the actions that we took on each of those occasions. Uh, we will, uh, we are uh, swift to uh, critique uh, our uh, actions. Uh, we look for what worked well, what didn't work well. We look at our decision making. Uh, I will tell you it's easy to Monday morning quarterback decisions that are made uh, in uh, a moment of uh, when you need to uh, do one thing or the other. Uh, we will certainly look at the decisions we made and uh, see how uh, uh, we uh, uh, if we uh, did what we thought would be best for the community. I will tell you in a summary that uh, we had no looting. We had very little property damage. Uh, there were some assaults, uh, mostly among uh, different protesters, uh, but we, uh, no, um, we had no reported of injuries. And uh, I can tell you uh, while uh, there is not total agreement on, uh, on how we responded by some uh, I will tell you, um, it was the first time that we have uh, been involved in something like that. It was much more violent than anything we had ever come across. And I believe we responded in a responsible fashion. Uh, so I will leave it at that, unless you have any questions. Thank you, Chief. So Chief, I wanna just uh, uh, follow up because I think it came up in, in a number of counselor uh, comments. Is the after action report the kind of evaluation you and I have talked about this over the past few days and kind of uh, what do you see as a timeline to address specifically the police action uh, I, I'd be real interested in kind of how that will be uh, approached and and in light of comments counselors made about who's involved and how how extensive is the group that looks at this that kind of information you get a chance to review that yet well, most of our, our after, after action reports are done internally where we uh, uh, right. self-critique ourselves, um, but we will uh, certainly provide a summary to council. And uh, I think I know you would be interested in that. Uh, it's hard for me to give you a time frame because quite frankly, we don't know when these protests and these marches are going to end. And um, uh, I would hope it would be in the very near future. Uh, we'd like to get them done as soon as we can uh, but I, I'm hesitant to give you uh, a date that we will be coming back to you, but we will try and do it uh, in a reasonable time frame. 
I'm sure you hear the urgency of this uh, from the council uh, and from the community. So I, I just, I know you hear it, right. remember it and think of us, okay? Absolutely. And, Mr. Mayor? Well, who's, who's asking? Matt? Councilor. Yeah. There he is, okay. I just wanted to say there was one specific incident that an after action report might be more uh, valid in a short term window as opposed to the whole time period. And if that could be advanced more quickly than the other after the whole thing is over, that would be great. And you're referring to? I think we all know the incident with a particular officer that has been on social media everywhere. Um, and just to that in, okay, that. thanks, Matt. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Okay. Anyone else have questions for the chief? Yes, Councillor uh, Nordyke. Thank you, Chief. Um, I, I my first question was going to be when can we see these reports? I understand not being able to give us a firm timeline, and I echo what Councillor Osik said. Clearly, the world is watching in terms of understanding the comments that the officer made to the person standing outside of the salon went viral for a reason, and the community is demanding to know what assurances will we have that this will ever happen again? How do we know that this is a one and done situation? How do we know that our officers are being trained to treat people fairly and to listen to people of color and to listen to marginalized communities? I think those are more rhetorical questions that I have in terms of feedback for you and your department that I sincerely appreciate. I really want to reiterate how many folks already are kneeling with us, who are supporting us, how many members of your police department have already come forward and been extremely supportive of these peaceful protests and the movement behind it for racial justice and equity. And so I really appreciate that. And I wanna make sure that you extend my gratitude to you to share with your officers that we appreciate every officer who is kneeling with us, every officer who is going out of his or her way to ensure that we are safe when there are protests. But I think, as you well know, this is feedback that needs to be shared with your, with your department. Uh, the other thing I would share is, um, you know, what assurances can we have that there will be stepped up community engagement with groups like NAACP? We were very lucky to have, well, I shouldn't say lucky, but we were pleased to see that uh, Deputy Chief Burke attended a recent NAACP meeting. We need more of that. Um, I have people who come to me with concerns about law enforcement because they are too scared to come forward themselves. And I, you know, I want to be that build bridges and assure them that you would not be retaliated against simply for bringing forward a concern, but there's a trust deficit here. And I see this as an opportunity for more engagement. This is an opportunity to build more bridges. My question for you is, um, mm -hmm. I've circulated the survey for the incoming police chief. Is, um, is that survey still open to the public to provide comment? And if so, do we have a timeline and more information about the selection committee for our incoming police chief? Because it seems to me that now more than ever, folks will be extremely invested in the qualities of our incoming police chief. Thank you, uh, Mayor. I can address that now, or yeah. Uh, why don't you go ahead? It's really the manager's purview here. Yes, Thank the, you. Uh, the the survey is is still available. We'll, we're still uh, gathering uh, a feedback and input on on the characteristics and profile for uh, Salem's next police chief. Uh, as council may remember, uh, Chief Moore announced his retirement at, at the end of last calendar year, and. And, and thankfully for us, uh, agreed to stay on as, as an interim chief while we began uh, the search for his replacement. Uh, that search is just getting started and, th and there will be opportunities for additional real community engagement and certainly involvement from council as we go through uh, the very important uh, task, uh, accomplishing the very important responsibility of, of selecting Salem's next police chief. Yes, Councillor Lewis. 
um, struggling for the right words to use, but I want to address comments to to Jerry Moore, not not as police chief, but as a lifelong resident of the city of Salem. And I, I am sorry for the pain that has been brought to you through no fault of your own. At the end of a career that is stellar, and yet you still volunteer to continue. I am one person on this body that, that is extremely grateful for the actions that the Salem police have taken over the last 10 days. The situation that we found us in with competing forces that both wanted to do damage and to keep that neutralized shows an effort that is absolutely outstanding. And I just want you to know that I, as a person, and I believe I represent at least my one with the gratitude for your work and the work of your officers. Thank you, Thank Counselor. You, Counselor. Thank you. If I could, Mayor, I'm, just very briefly. You bet. Um, on Counselor uh, Nordyke's comments, uh, I'm sure she uh, is aware, but she may not be. Um, we have out, had outreach uh, as one of our uh, main priorities uh, for, I can tell you, uh, as long as I've been chief and, and much sooner uh, or much before that as well. And as Councillor Anderson probably knows very well, our relationship with the NAACP is probably second to none uh, uh, among police agencies in the area. We have reached out, uh, we've included them in our training. And uh, I think uh, uh, while we were talking, while we were here tonight, uh, Benny Williams called me on the phone and I just couldn't get to it because I told him I was in a council meeting. But uh, uh, I, I, I just want to stress that outreach to our minority community has been um, a priority for me uh, since the day I became chief of police. And I think, I'm, I'm just gonna be honest and tell you, I think we have done a very good job there. And if you listen to uh, your constituents, I think believe they would tell you the same. So thanks. Thank you, Chief. I, I, I got a second what you say. I've followed this for the past 14 years. I know Nanky longer. Uh, and you have uh, just done a, a stellar job in, in uh, these relationships. I think one of the really great opportunities coming out of this, looking for, looking for a little silver lining here, is people will be able to find out what's going on in terms of training. I, I follow that because I've been on the council all these years and have taken the time as a citizen to learn what your training, your protocols, the outreach looks like. And I, as I listen to discussion of this, I realize this is just not commonly known. And I think one of the opportunities we'll have will be to share uh, the level of involvement, the level of uh, uh, broad relationships the department has in the community. And at the same time, we'll be able to hear the concerns that still exist in the community that I know you and your department will take seriously and move forward on if there's corrective action, if there's changes in policies and protocols, equipment, whatever it takes, uh, I, I, that I think is, is uh, uh, one reason I think there will be a, a very positive outcome from what is right now a, a really uh, demanding situation. Councilor Nanke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I, I want to uh, mirror those comments as well. I, I've been involved with the Salem Police Department and I'm in my 20th year now from the council, many more years prior to that through neighborhood associations and, and other um, institutions as well. And our police department is second to none. Um, I've attended numerous NAACP events um, with Salem PD, they are everywhere inside of every element of our community and, and we've worked so hard and the rest of the world is seeing this snapshot of a piece of us trying to be peacekeepers um, and, and they neglect to, to know what our standard practices are and, and we've been thrown into a negative light but what I, what I will tell whoever is watching tonight and whoever watches this in the future as well is our police department is second to none in the way we care for our people, 
and the way we attempt to keep the peace, and sometimes you have to do that by any means necessary. Um, it, it was tragic over the last 10 days that we actually had to, for the first time, um, utilize some measures that we've never had to before. And uh, those were not Salem people that we were responding to as well. We had, there was an influx of people coming in here and I would just, again, like to, to say that every Salem police officer that I've been in contact with for 20 years is beyond reproach and, and we care for our community, all elements of our community and, and the peace and, and safety of, of all of our citizens. So thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, if I could, I, I, I want to cut this. Uh, it's, your, it's your show, but uh, I just want to say. No, it's your show, Jerry. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of where we are, but as I said in a statement, we are a learning organization. And the reason why I think we maintain uh, the proficiency and the professionalism that we do is because we're willing to learn and we're willing to change. And I can assure sure all of you uh, that we are certainly paying attention to what is going on in our community in this world right now today and we will uh, do everything we can to make whatever um, um, shifts in our direction that we need to be that need to be made so that we can uh, maintain uh, uh, this community's confidence in us so thank you thank you thank you chief that's absolutely what we all count on and we know that's the case so thank you very much for reiterating that uh, Councilor Kayser. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Chief Moore. I wanted to just follow up on the point you just made that um, strong organizations question themselves um, all the time and improve. Weak organizations don't. Um, and I also believe that to have a strong organization is you do have to have those resources that you need to do to do the job well and to, and to learn from that. Um, and I think we can see when we have removed those resources from places, things start to fall apart um, because there's no investment in that anymore. Um, and I certainly want to continue to invest in, in our police department and our fire department and all of our city services. I also want to expand where we can. I think, um, I think police have been asked to do a lot um, over the last 20 years. It's really changed the nature of policing and community policing. I think we've seen huge disinvestments in things like mental health. Again, we keep coming back to this as a state, <laughs> disinvestment at an incredible level. As a county, disinvestment, and now who's left to pick it up? It's the city. And where has that fallen? It's fallen within the police department largely. Is that the right place for it? Probably not. Is that what we have right now as our mechanism? Yes. Should we perhaps reevaluate that? Yes. Are we going to do it within a week? No. Is there time to talk about that? Yes. So I think it's just, this is bringing up a lot of questions. I don't think any of the questions are, are wrong or not valid. I think that there's, you have to take them within time though. Um, and it's, it's, it's very difficult situation. Um, it's very complex. And I think through all of this, we've learned that things are, things are not just an either or, it's it's mostly a both and <laughs> we need to figure out how to make how to make both and work so um thanks for taking the time to talk with us today thank you great well thank you very much chief did you want to say anything I, further i've said enough thank you oh we always like hearing from you thank you okay mr manager you have anything else what else have you been doing No, nothing else to share this evening. Okay, great. Okay, I have a proclamation. Whereas the city of Salem at all times strives for justice, freedom, and equity, and whereas the city of Salem reaffirms the personal liberties of all its residents and does not tolerate any violation of anyone's civil and human rights, and whereas peaceful assembly and protest for those wishing to lift their voices as a way of expressing concerns after the recent death of George Floyd is fully supported and deemed appropriate by the city. And whereas we as a city acknowledge that the road to true equity remains long, the devastating and senseless loss of life because of the color of a person's skin 
demands that we all look inward and dedicate ourselves as agents of genuine societal change. And whereas the city of Salem encourages compassionate, positive action to honor the lives lost and improves the lives of our friends and neighbors, and whereas in honor of the memory of George Floyd and others before him, we urge that the community work diligently to assure a rich and diverse community future. Now, therefore, I, Chuck Bennett, mayor of the city of Salem, do hereby proclaim from this day forward an affirmation in support of peaceful assembly and urge all residents to uphold and respect the civil and human rights of every, every individual. Dated this uh, fourth day of June, 2020. Okay. I'm sure we'll be talking about this issue more in the future. I think as we begin incorporating some of the suggestions we heard tonight uh, into actual uh, action items and begin uh, moving it forward. So let's move to the consent calendar, Councillor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move approval of the consent calendar with the exception of item 2.2B, pulled by Councillor Lewis. All righty. Second. Second by Kayser. Thank you. Item 2.1A is uh, the May 26, 2020 draft city council minutes. Item 2.2A adopts resolution 2020-27, closing the civic gifts and memorial fund and transferring the remaining balance to the public art fund. Item 2.2B has been pulled. Item 2.3A adopts the recommendation from the Judicial Compensation Review Commission to maintain the current total compensation for the municipal judge, make a market adjustment for the judges pro tem to increase the rate uh, to or $79 per hour. Uh, effective July 1, 2020, the municipal judge shall receive the same cost of living adjustment as the unrepresented position classification. And that concludes the consent calendar. Thank you. Any further discussion? If the city recorder would call a roll. Councilor Nanke. Aye. Councilor Leung. Aye. Councilor Osik? Aye. Councilor Hoy? Aye. Councilor Nordyke? Aye. Councilor Lewis? Aye. Councilor Kayser? Aye. Councilor Anderson? Aye. And Mayor Bennett? Aye. Motion passes. So we'll go to public hearings. I'm going to open the public hearing on state revenue sharing funds. City Recorder? The City Council will now hold a public hearing regarding state revenue sharing funds and the hearing will begin with a staff presentation. Good evening, Mayor Bennett and City Council. I'm Josh Eggleston, the City's Budget Officer. To receive state revenue sharing funds, the City is required to hold two public hearings. The first public hearing to discuss the possible uses of state revenue sharing was held by the Budget Committee on May 6th. This evening's public hearing, which covers the proposed uses of state revenue sharing funds, was noticed on the city's website on May 29th. The proposed use of the state revenue sharing funds in the amount of $1,974,130, as recommended by the Budget Committee, is an offset to the cost of provi providing police patrol services. City Council approval of this proposed use is signified by adoption of Resolution 2020-25. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for staff? All righty. I need a. I guess I'll close the public hearing and Councillor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move adoption of resolution number 2020-25, electing to receive a share of certain revenues from the State of Oregon General Fund. Second. Second, Second by. Osik. Osik. Thank you. Okay. You please call the roll, City Recorder. Councillor Leung. Aye. Councillor Osik. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Lewis. Aye. Councillor Kayser. Aye. Councillor Anderson. Aye. Councillor Nanke. Is it? That... Try it again. Oh, Councillor Nanke. Aye. Oh. Here we go. And Mayor Bennett. Aye. Motion passes. Okay. Uh, open a public hearing on the 2021 City of Salem budget. 
The City Council will now hold a public hearing regarding the fiscal year 2021 City of Salem budget. The hearing will begin with the staff presentation. Approving public budget law requires the budget committee to recommend a budget to the City Council, which it did on May 13th. Change, changes were made via errata sheets approved by the budget committee to the city manager's proposed budget provided as an attachment one. The city council is required to hold a public hearing on the recommended budget. Notice of this public this evening's public hearing was published on the city's website on May 29th. Following the public hearing, staff recommends the city council deliberate on the recommended budget within the restrictions provided in law, which are property taxes cannot be increased from the rate levied by the budget committee and no funds expenditures can be increased by more than 10%. Within these restrictions, the city council may make changes to the recommended budget. Following deliberations of the budget, the city council is asked to approve any changes to the budget this evening to allow staff to return with the resolution to adopt the budget on June 22nd. At that time- Heidi, oh, I'm sorry, are you done, Josh? I uh, Almost, at that time- uh, Sorry. Staff, no, no worries. At that time, staff will ask the city council to amend the budget approval made this evening to include any rebudgeted or carryover projects from fiscal year 2020, at which staff are currently identifying as well as any other appropriation needs. A complete list of carryover items will be included in the fiscal year 2021 budget will be provided to the city council with the agenda packet for the June 22nd, 2020 meeting. I would like to note that while real-time public comment is not available, Multiple pieces of testimony have been received and are available in your agenda packet this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Josh? Okay. I'm sorry, is this just the fee schedule? This is the Councilor budget? Optic. Well, I thought the agenda item was the fee schedule for the budget. Did I read that wrong? No, the fee schedule is under special orders of business. It was pulled off of the consent calendar. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Hoy. Um, any, any other questions? Councillor Hoy? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move, uh, we direct staff to return on June 22nd, 2020 with a resolution to adopt the budget committee recommended the fiscal year 2021 city of Salem budget. Okay. Second. Second by Lewis. Excuse me, Mayor, if we could close the public hearing. Well, uh, close public hearing. Let's try it again. God. Do I need okay, to we, do yeah, we have the again? motion. We have the second. Now we'll have the vote. Okay. Everybody okay? Councillor Osik. Nay. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Lewis. Aye. Councillor Kayser. Aye. Councilor Anderson. Aye. Councilor Nanke. Aye. Councilor Leung. Nay. And Mayor Bennett. Aye. Motion passes. Okay. Go to uh, special orders of business. Uh, Councilor Lewis. You pull yes. uh, 2.2 B. Right. Um, I move staff recommendation with one amendment, and that is that the new fee schedule would be starting on January 1st, 2021, rather than July 1st, 2020. I'll second for discussion. Thank you, seconds. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Lewis. I I'm not going to spend any time at all talking about the unique situation that we find ourselves in. Um, and I'm not going to dispute the need for the city to align its fees. My only concern is that the, there are some dramatic increases in some of these fees that I don't think the public has an understanding of yet. Our minds are being preoccupied by other things right now. And I believe that it's fair to hold this off until January 1st rather than start these charges July 1st. All righty. Any further dis yes, Councillor Nanke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I messaged uh, Councillor Hoy or Council President Hoy yesterday. After I looked through this, it was like, oh my gosh. Um, 
numerous of these fees are 30%, 50%, 100%. The biggest one I think I saw of significance was a 400% increase in a, in a fee. We just had a work session on affordable housing, and I'd like to to know what the impact per unit or per single family residential that, that inside of this, because we're talking thousands upon thousands of dollars increases in a lot of these fees. And I, I probably won't support Councillor Lewis's motion just to push it off until January. Um, these are obscene in my opinion. Um, and, and we really need to understand the rationale for doubling and tripling a couple of these fees because it can't just be to make up for that. We've been raising these every year. And what changed that, that makes us need to actually increase by that percentage when our entire community is suffering? I mean, we're talking increases to center 50 plus in recreation, in housing. It's 33 pages of changes they, they gave us this summary sheet just so we can see what the changes are. And there's 33 full pages of fairly small print that are uh, significant in my opinion. And, and um, I do understand the fact that we need in a lot of these cases to recover uh, for what services we provide, but, but we get absolutely no justification as to, to why the level of increases are happening on a lot of these. Um, I, I'm not in support of it without a lot more discussion. Uh, counselor, is there a categorical area that's got you disturbed here? What? No, I, when I, when you first start through and you're in page one, two, three, site plan review, design review, um, center 50 plus parks, rec, um, annexations if someone wants to send it out it it, it doubled from like six thousand to twelve thousand dollars if somebody wants to shoot something out onto the ballot why um okay climbing up there you want a free point? site plan review went from nine hundred dollars to twenty four hundred dollars on okay. what is it page four it's like i need justification for quadrupling a fee that we've been doing forever. Did you answer your own question there? I mean, 33 pages <laughs> of this and, and we get very little of it. And, and, and unless I have some rationale as to why a, an increase needs to take place at that percentage rate, I, I can't support it. Okay. Mr. Manager, you want to speak to the counselor's questions and concerns, either specifically or generally? Uh, specifically, because generally, I think the comments from Councillor Lewis and Councillor Nanke are, are accurate, and that is the fees are intended to, to have the people benefiting from services pay for those services. Regarding the specific fee areas, uh, we can start with community development and community development director uh, Norm Wright is, is prepared to uh, try to answer the, the questions that are being brought up. Okay, Wright. Yeah, hi, Mayor. Norman Wright, community development director. And so, uh, Councillor Nanke, you mentioned a few different fees there. And uh, you also mentioned an interest in understanding the rationale behind these. So I'll just start with the rationale. And uh, there may be some uh, additional uh, information that we can provide on a specific fee in particular. But our rationale starts with the fact that we uh, are seeking to achieve 100% cost recovery for all of our development review fees in the same manner for planning that we already see for building and safety. And so every one of the fee increases that you see on that sheet that relate to building and planning review fees are an, essentially calculated at the start by careful accounting of all the staff time that is dedicated on average to each one of those services. In the instances where you find that we have significant increases 
there can be a number of reasons for that, but again, by and large, this is reflective of the staff time that is committed to each one of those. Now, to give just a brief example of how this can be also a benefit, uh, certainly there are instances where we have gone from practically only half to maybe three, two thirds of cost recovery to 100% cost recovery, and that has created an increase in the fees. But there is one instance in particular that I wanna highlight where this rationale cuts both ways, and that is with our multifamily development review. With the new multifamily standards that the council adopted just earlier this year, uh, we have effectively created a new path for applicants so that they can submit applications for multifamily development that no longer require what would be considered a class three review. That policy change creates a new, more efficient process for both staff as well as the applicant. And that now can save those individuals anywhere from $1,800 to $2,800 on a particular application and fee. So again, when it comes to the rationale here, the rationale is that the staff time is pretty substantial as well as the uh, notification costs for mailing notices. But where policy does create new flexibility, we also create flexibility in the fees and reduce those fees accordingly. So um, it might not be as easily reflected there, but what we're doing again is trying to recoup the cost for the service, deliver the best we can and keep improving it so that we can drive those costs further down over time. I hope that's a good help in starting to understand our, our rationale. As a, as a general matter, where do we sit in comparison to other communities in the development fee area? Are we in the middle? Are we at the low end, high end? Where are we? Yeah, Mayor, in a few instances, we are, uh, when it comes to planning fees particularly, uh, we are very much at the bottom of the pack in comparison and or the middle of the pack. So if our Comparative cities include places like Gresham, Portland, Beaverton, and perhaps even if we want to include a nearby city like uh, Corvallis as well as Eugene. We can take a few of these and see, for example, that when it comes to a 50 lot subdivision, uh, our fee is the second lowest of comparable cities uh, in the state. If you look at 20 lot subdivisions, we're the third lowest. If you look at something like partition fees, which clock in and under the new fee schedule at about 4,400 and change, uh, we are in the middle of the pack uh, by our comparable cities. So in no way are we seeing ourselves as a, as a, uh, a I, don't, I guess I'd say a, a leader in the pack, so to speak. Uh, our fees are definitely within the delta of what we see with surrounding cities. Thank you, Councilor Nanke. Thanks. And, and I know we've been working towards cost recovery over the years as well. Um, I also know we have an affordable housing issue right now. And, and just to speak to a uh, class three, um, I'm, I'm looking just at site uh, plan review on pages you know, four and five. And if, if I have a multifamily class three that um, is five hundred thousand dollars to a million dollars? My fee went from eight hundred ninety-seven dollars to three thousand thirty-six, which is a hundred dollar or twenty-one hundred dollar increase. You get down into a, a little higher dollar value ones, four to four and a half million. I went up forty-five hundred dollars, and and we're talking about they get a benefit of eighteen to twenty-eight hundred dollars. Well. That's not a benefit if I just increase their fees by four or five or six thousand dollars as I move through that. So it, it's this fee schedule is always tough because yeah. we make a lot of changes. There's a ton of new fees on here that we've never seen before as well. And and then we in this one are truly seeing some significant 400, 500 percent increases uh, without a lot of it, it feels bad okay. <laughs> when everybody is, is starving right now. Well, okay, Councilor Anderson. Oh, sorry. Mr. Mayor, I've got a question for the city attorney first. Is there some time problem here? That is, if this were to be discussed at the June 22nd meeting, our next meeting, could it stand? We decide to 
make it effective as of July 1. Could that happen without any legal uh, restrictions? Right. So if, if council doesn't adopt the new fee schedule, the existing fees will stay in effect. There are, you know, a number of new fees that aren't on the current. No, what, what I'm saying, uh, city attorney, is if we adopt it now, it would have the same effect on, uh, if we adopt it on the 22nd, it would have the same effect as if we adopted it now in terms of it becomes effective July 1. That's correct. Uh, then, then I move to table this uh, motion uh, till uh, the next next council meeting. Second. Second. Second by Nanke. Councilor Osik. Yes, I just wanted to say I actually agree with the motion as it is uh, seeking to collect the revenues that the city is spending, but. I agree with Councilor Nanke completely that there is not really a report justifying those fees. So I would like to see that report. Isn't a, a motion to table not debatable? Yeah, I just let Nosik speak for a second. He, I keep overlooking him, so I felt compelled. I apologize, but it, it's unfair what's happening because he's just on the phone. I was actually your second, Tom, I think. So, he, yeah, he's, he's given the second speech. Okay, uh, let's let's do a roll call on that one. On, and it's on the tabling motion, okay? Correct. All right. Councillor Hoy. No. Councillor Nordyke. No. Councillor Lewis. No. Councillor Kayser. Aye. Councillor Anderson. Aye. Councilor Nakey. Aye. Councilor Leung. Aye. Councilor Osik. Aye. And Mayor Bennett. No. I'm going to count on you to, I couldn't count them on, I don't have enough fingers. Okay, so that was four nays to five, five eyes. Okay, motion passes. This is tabled until the uh, June 22nd meeting. Mr. Manager, I would suggest if there is a staff report that kind of summarizes all of this that has not reached the counselors that are all of us, I guess, uh, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Understood. Okay. Yes. Mr. Mayor? Yes. I, I was the one who made the motion. I just want to say I don't necessarily, I agree that we ought to uh, yeah. co get costs recovered and uh, I would be in favor of it. I just think if we've got two weeks to get a little more information, that's fine. Right. And I expect I'll be voting for the motion as put forward by Councillor Hoy as opposed to the amended motion. Okay, well, we'll this will give everybody a chance to have a really close look. And I think uh, the request is certainly not unreasonable to try to educate, uh, educate yourself on what's going on here. Councillor Lewis, motion or something? No, I just wanted to, I guess, ask as far as the report goes, to my main concern about the time frame is I believe there are a lot of people in the city that don't have a clue, don't have a clue about these fee increases. And I'll use just the one as an example. That's the annexation vote that raises the cost of a simple annexation by $5,000. There are people out there that are using annexation of their property as their life savings. And now, are they going to be able to do it? Do they even know about this? So I'd like to, in this report, like to know what the city has done as far as communicating with the citizens, not just folks like the home builders and the realtors, but the citizens about these fees, because I don't believe the general public knows anything about them. Okay, very fair. Okay, we move on then to information reports. Yo. I have, I actually have a special order of business. I would like to bring forward a motion and I actually have two motions to make so kind of segue okay counselor there there's a problem here we need if when you guys want to do these motions you need to turn them in earlier so we everybody gets to see them and then we they they get scheduled uh well, what I believe this that? motion's urgent and well I, yeah once, once you hear it you'll understand why so and I can okay, bring describe up the motion you'd like to make, and let's see where I we're will. going. I will make it 
So I move that council direct staff to implement weekend closures to portions of court, state, and high streets to allow downtown restaurants to use the streets for expanded dining areas and that council waive right of way use permit fees for participating businesses. Second. And then I'd like to make a second motion, which is I further move that council suspend its rules so that council can take action on this motion tonight. Second. All righty, let's go on the suspension of rules. Everybody understands what we'll be doing here. This is so we can vote on this tonight. Um, and I, well, I'll I call to the first. This is just the suspension of rules at this point, okay? Uh, all those in fav favor of the suspension of rules respond when your name is called. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Nordyke. Aye. Councilor Lewis. No. Councilor Kayser. Aye. Councilor Anderson. Aye. Councilor Nanke. No. Councilor Leung. Aye. Councilor Osik. Aye. Councilor Hoy. Aye. And Mayor Bennett. No. Motion passes. So we will suspend the rules. And now why don't you make your uh, motion again, just so we all have it again. So the motion is, I move that council direct staff to implement weekend closures to portions of court, state, and high streets to allow downtown restaurants to use the streets for expanded dining areas and that council waive right of way use permit fees for participating businesses. And that was second by Hoy. And I'll speak to my motion. Yeah. This is a request coming from businesses in our downtown who are severely hurting. And the reason why I bring it up tonight and why I, I couldn't get it on the, the um, agenda is I, I thought for a while that this was going to be done administratively uh, by the city manager. Um, it came to my attention pretty late on um, this week and over the weekend that we needed council action to do this and that it wasn't something that could be administratively done. Um, but this is coming at the request of many businesses downtown. I've spoken with um, the Salem Main Street Association, um, who is in turn speaking with about 15 to 20 businesses specifically. Uh, the businesses are a mix of restaurants and retail, and they are all supportive of doing this. And, and what it would entail is uh, closing some blocks downtown starting on um, Saturdays at 6 a.m. through Sundays at 8 p.m. Um, and the locations would be Court Street between Front and High Street, um, State Street between Front and High Street, and then High Street between State and Ferry. And then all the intersections of those streets with Commercial and Liberty um, and High would remain open for vehicles and parking and all of that. Um, and tentatively looking at doing this beginning this Saturday and going on through through the summer or until the COVID related restrictions are lifted so that our restaurants can have more people within doors. This is really, as I talked with, um, uh, as I understand it, it's really a turning point for us as to what we as a silly city are willing to do to help our downtown businesses. Um, this isn't a question of will, what are, the, what are things gonna look like next year? Businesses are really asking themselves, am I even gonna be here next year? because of the revenue they've lost over the last three months with just having to be closed. Um, the reason for closing streets is to increase the space, the square footage that businesses would have to serve their customers. Um, especially our restaurants, they're limited to, I think it's half of their seating. So many of those restaurants are just, they're storing their seating. They've, they put it in storage. Um, this would allow them essentially their square footage. They can bring out their seating and put it out on, on the street. Um, summertime is where the, our restaurants, especially in downtown retailers, they do most of their business in the summer, uh, cause people are outside and it's nice and you want to walk around. Um, it also is not just benefiting restaurants. It's benefiting the retailers too. Cause when people are downtown, they do more than just eat. I mean, they're, they're going shopping, they're going inside stores, um, closing off a few blocks would really create an environment where people felt like, hey, let's come back downtown and, and take a look what's going on in a safe way, in a way that's compliant with 
um, all of the restrictions that are in place for Marion County, but still giving our businesses the best chance of, of succeeding <laughs> through through this year so that they can uh, reopen when we get to that point when we can fully reopen. Uh, I've heard concerns specifically from staff about limiting parking downtown for these blocks. Um, those are things that the businesses have heard also, but, but they are really on board with get, just getting people back downtown. And if this is a way we can do it, then then they, they've said, you know, we, we have our parking people can use, they can park on adjacent blocks. There are ways to get around not being able to park directly in front of somebody's businesses. So I know I'm bringing up this motion in a weird way. It's unorthodox, but it is urgent. It really is. And I couldn't wait another two weeks for council to convene to bring it. So I believe our, our, this requires our action as quickly as possible. And I hope that you'll support the motion. Yeah, it's really understandable, Councillor. I, after hearing what you're up to, I, it makes some sense. Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm now speaking as a lawyer with process. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm speak I guess some weird message came on my screen. I'm speaking as a lawyer who's interested in process. And normally, I don't like these, you know, suspending a rules motions for a number of reasons, but these are not ordinary times for two reasons, the, the uh, situation with the uh, murder of Floyd and then the COVID stuff. And so it's Councillor uh, Kayser's ward and I know she's been talking with people down there and I think it's something we ought, to, we ought to look at. And I also agree that now's the time to do it rather than two weeks from now. So I'll be voting for the motion. Yeah, I am sorry we didn't hear from any of the downtown businesses or Main Street Association in terms of this, but I'm I, I really uh, pleased that you have talked with them, Councillor, that you know that you have a good, strong support downtown for this. So appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Councillor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to uh, support this motion. I think that basically we have an opportunity to kind of throw a lifeline to some of our downtown businesses and actually as our downtown to our downtown as a whole. It's kind of suffering right now. The entire city is suffering, but really our downtown, uh, other than out here in East Salem, downtown is the core. And I want to throw them a lifeline <laughs> best we can. And uh, I think this is an opportunity to do it. You know, businesses are open right now, but they don't have a lot of seating available because of the COVID restrictions. This expands that. It's it basically, I think of it as I discussed it with Councillor Kayser uh, late this afternoon. It seems like kind of just like a first Wednesday, but expanded. And it just seems like a really good opportunity to kind of rebuild community. We're all holed up in our houses right now. The community is kind of all holed up and has been for the last few months and our businesses are suffering. And this would be a really great way to sort of give them a little bit of a chance to get a kickstart. And I think it would be very little cost to the city, um, but it would benefit the whole community. And I, I, I very much support the motion. Councilor Lewis. Sorry, um, you know, I'm gonna vote for the motion because I've been excited about this idea for over a month now when I first started hearing about it happening throughout the country. And, and Salem is perfect for it. And, and I think it's a tremendous idea, but I, I do have a problem with the process and you know how we love process and this is not process enough. Um, it's unfortunate that we didn't go through a process that would have included more people and to make sure that we did it right, rather than just take a chance that this is the right place, this is the right time. Um, but quite frankly, I'm so excited about it that even if it's one street, I'd still be voting for it. Well, think about the process, Councillor. You can just bring it up at the next meeting if, if we get a big, I'm sure Councillor Kayser will be monitoring this closely and we'll be glad to bring us a motion. Can Councilor Leung. Can I just respond really quick, Mr. Mayor? Yeah. So Councilor Lewis, I appreciate your comments and I agree it's not ideal for me either. Um, and I would hope that we take a look at how, how it works and I mean, possibly even expanding or changing the blocks or, I mean, I can think of places in West Salem too, especially along Edgewater where this would be really beneficial. So I'm definitely not opposed to having some feedback from, from the community about this and then making adjustments where necessary. Good. Uh, Councillor Leon. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilor Cage, I think I, I'm going to also vote in support of your motion. I think it's a fantastic idea. Um, I, I've seen some posts from um, community members who are interested in having our city explore that. And I think uh, even if it's starting with downtown, then perhaps like even rotating, like as Councilor Lewis mentioned, to different locations so that we could um, support our businesses wherever they're located. Um, that would be uh, very helpful and also equitable, ensuring that people, no matter where they are and where their business is located, they get the support we need. Uh, I did have a question that might be more of a staff related thing. Um, since right now, Marion County is still under phase two and I, or phase one, and I believe um, Polk County is too. Are we, would we be permitted under the current guidelines to start this right away? Or do we have to wait until we reach phase two before we're allowed to do outdoor um, seating as an option? Uh, it is possible in phase one if the restaurants, dining establishments follow the Oregon Health Authority uh, guidelines and requirements for, for dining. So it, it is it is permissible. Are, are OLCC permits also required, Mr. Manager, if people are going to expand outdoors? Is there any OLCC issues here? Uh, the Oregon Liquor Control Commission does have uh, a process for expanding licensed premises uh, and we'll have to review to ensure that use of city street city public rights of way similar to use of a city sidewalk is is permissible and if not certainly uh, have the uh, license holder uh, go through the Oregon Liquor Control Commission process and, and our process which we'll we'll do our best to expedite well if this passes I hope we'll work with each of the uh, businesses to facilitate that licensing uh, to kind of expedite it to the extent we have any role in it, that, that it's sort of pointless if they can't get what they need in terms of the licensing requirements from the state to go ahead. Ms. Rutherford, do you have anything on this? Yeah, so um, just a couple of comments. We have been working on a dining platform program that would take some of the parking spaces offline and that would be um, every day, you know, so that these businesses could have expanded outdoor dining space um, Monday through Friday and not just on the weekends. Um, so that's something that we're, we're currently taking through review by the fire department, by the building and safety department. That wouldn't be affected by this motion, would it? You'd continue uh, that. Would not. If they do choose to put a dining platform in space, they would just continue with seating on the other side of the dining platform into the street, um, where the dining platform would just remain um, in the parking space area. Um, with regards to starting this immediately, um, well, I think that this is the community who will be really excited by this idea. Um, I have some concerns with getting the messaging out in this time frame to downtown residents and employees and folks that have been parking on the street, because right now we have had a suspension of our three hour parking and not requiring people to be back in the parking garages through June 30th. Um, and we have made on-street parking available for them through the end of the month. So this will be removing a lot of spaces on the weekend uh, for people that have um, basically given up their permits um, to save money until the end of the month. Uh, and this is a pretty short time frame to get word out to individuals for them to find alternate parking. Um, we'll also have to work through issues of, you know, providing the notice to individuals and how are we going to deal with cars that are still on the street come Saturday morning that at maybe 11 o'clock after tables are set up, want to move their car. So, you know, I think this, um, well, it's, I think it's a great idea. It's not going to be without some access challenges, especially the first weekend of, as people are getting used to the concept. Um, and then one other concern uh, and an area where we may want to consider some adjustments is we do have a number of businesses and residences that, um, and service delivery that accesses the alleys. And while most service delivery is Monday through Friday, 
I received an email from at least one restaurant that does have a concern about alley access for service delivery on the weekends and how this would impact those deliveries. Uh, so if we were to close down um, the streets, the full block stretches of the streets, we could have some challenges there uh, with if there's service delivery or if we've got, for example, we have residents that live on Court Street and they access their car uh, from the alley off of Court Street, um, where this, it, it just could pre present some complexities for people um, getting in and out when we haven't had a lot of time to do outreach or communicate to people and let them know that, that we will be closing things down. Councilor Kayser, do you want, what are your thoughts on? Well, thanks. Well, my thoughts are, I guess, it would be good, I guess, to get an estimate of what you think would be in a reasonable amount of time Mm -hmm. um so like perhaps june 20th the weekend i mean that's almost a full two weeks mm -hmm. to get people notice like hey this is going to be shut down beginning this date and for people who are parking on the street and then i guess i'd want to know which business specifically is getting delivery and if they would be impacted or not um, so, within the blocks we're talking about so it was ritters was the business that emailed about concern about service delivery um, another way that we could approach this is rather than full block closures, and, and we've looked at this really closely when we've looked at locations for taking parking spaces offline for dining platforms, um, is to do half blocks. For example, maybe on Court Street, when we're looking at Court Street to the east of Liberty, that we just go from the alley to high and close that off because we don't have restaurants from the alley to Liberty. And that way people could still use the, the alleys. And they would just, instead of making a left out onto court, they would have to make a, a right or, you know, so that they'd be heading towards Liberty Street. And if, and if I can respond, Mr. Mayor, I, sure. I, I'm very open to all those ideas. I think the goal of this motion today was because I learned that this could not be done administratively. Right. I wanted to get it out there. So that the count, so that staff could be directed to be to give them the authority to continue the work, essentially, um, without having to wait for that at the end of this month. So I'm yeah. I'm completely open though to how that's implemented as far as making sure that we get what the businesses are asking for. Do you, Councilor? I I can't recall how specific your motion is. Did you set it up for this coming weekend? I mean, do you have that much specificity? I just don't recall. Uh, I'll, I'll repeat it really quick. Would you? Thanks. It's, I move that council direct staff to implement weekend closures to portions of Court State and High Streets to allow downtown restaurants to use the streets for expanding expanded dining areas, and that council waive right of way use permit fees for participating businesses. Well, that fits really well with what Ms. Rutherford's saying. So good, Councilor Nanke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And that's one of the problems with, you know, shooting Councilor motions on the fly as well. And I really appreciate Councilor Kayser's in, intent on this. Um, but if it's something that staff can't do, could we not even specify the street and just advocate, um, allow the city manager to allow street closures for restaurants. I, my, my concern is, and Director Rutherford actually spoke to it, you may have a business that really needs drive-by who really hates this idea, but we have several restaurants that are you know, hemorrhaging because they can't get enough people inside of their facility to actually make a profit. Um, so rather than us pick this street, this street, and this street, knowing that uh, Director Rutherford's been getting input, we haven't really been able to, to sort this out. I know there's been some comments and encouragement from certain restaurants, but can, can we not limit it to specific streets or specific blocks and just have staff research and close those streets and, and allow that uh, permit uh, waiver as appropriate. What do you, what do you think, Councilor Kayser? I'm, I'm open to that idea. I think, you know, staff definitely needs to consult the businesses um, that are there 
Is there would you mind broadening your motion to include all streets downtown yeah, just for that's review? Fine. All streets. I mean, I think we will run into issues with like Liberty. Sure. Well, we know we can't do those. That's right. you know, I mean, you're right. right. You're absolutely right. So it, it's kind of the ones that were chosen were because they're not like state highways. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that makes that makes sense. Um, well, I, I don't have any trouble broadening it. Um, it, your your motion gets the ball rolling. I suspect if you find you can broaden it or if you need to contract it for whatever reasons, you'll be back. So, am I right on that? Yes. Okay, I thought yeah, so. I think Councilor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, as I understand it, the whole idea behind this motion, and it, it was drafted in consultation with the city attorney, as I understand it, but the whole idea is that we just, that the city manager understands that there's more than just one one or two counselors that are interested in this there's right a group of us and that we just he just needs our direction to get it done and the it part are you know, the details and that's what we pay him to do well, i'm not sure it's a, even a, a few of you it sounds like the whole yeah. council is pretty unanimous in this idea i hope so uh what uh you want to speak again brad yeah just just quickly and again that gets back to the naming of the individual streets versus giving city staff the authorization to move forward uh, as applicable. Um, because if we're gonna sit there and go back and forth and some businesses can, hey, yeah, now my restaurant can be in the street, but because my, my street wasn't named in the motion, um, ours can't. So yeah. I'm just trying to, you know, yeah. a lot of times if we were in person, Councillor Kayser's motion could have actually been passed out to each of the councillors because I don't recall the dates on that. And is it just weekends or is it some evenings? Um, and, and with the flexibility, staff could actually do that first Wednesday piece or Saturday and Sunday. And it, it's giving staff the authorization to deal with business owners and allow them to expand their business opportunities um, as they see fit and as uh, will be acceptable to the rest of the community and the uh, the neighboring businesses. Yeah. Uh, Councilor Nordyke. Thank you. I believe the motion is drafted with the intended flexibility to make it happen, and I look forward to supporting it. And on a related note, as I'm sure many of you saw in the paper, we have another a flagship store, JCPenney, leaving the downtown community. As many of you know, it's not just the Salem JCPenney that's closing, but several JCPenney's that are closing. That leaves us with another empty big box store in our downtown. This creates a huge vacuum, or does it also create a huge opportunity? I We've got a lot on our plate today, but I just wanna flag this for further discussion. You know, that is a, a lot of square footage. And you know what we have a huge shortage of in this community is affordable housing. So I would like us to take a look at, I would like to first educate myself and understand, you know, how can the city incentivize smart usage of that space? Is there another tenant waiting in the wings to take on that kind of square footage? I don't know, but to support our downtown core, I would like to find ways to, frankly, embrace the reality that a lot of the big box stores are going away. And many of them may be going away forever. So perhaps trying to replace it with another big box store is not a part of our future economic reality, given the fact that plenty of department stores are in trouble because of COVID-19. So I just wanna flag that for future discussion when we have time to really think about it and not do a motion on the fly. Um, I, for one, think that sometimes motions on the fly are appropriate and are a duty for leaders to respond. And sometimes that means you have to move fast. And so I fully support Kayser's, uh, Counselor Kayser's motion. And I hope we can discuss in the future, what can we do about the fact that we have big box stores through financial reasons that are bigger than us, bigger than Salem, are going away. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Kayser. Thanks, and thanks, Councillor Nordyke. I actually had the same exact thought as you did when I heard J.C. Penney's was leaving. Was like, can we turn that into affordable housing somehow? I don't know. But okay, well, let's talk about your motion. Anyways, before we... yeah, 
uh, move so to on back, to, 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 go back to, to the back. national economics of big box stores and why 150 JC pennies closed around the country. So to go back to Councillor Nakey's point, um, I'd be or question, I would be um, comfortable with expanding the motion to whatever streets downtown. Um, you want to just authorize staff to review this and move forward? Uh, just do it that way. Yeah. So if I need to change the motion, I don't. I'm happy to do that if it's going to be helpful. But well, Dan helped you write it. Dan will help you write it right now. Dan, how do we fix this to reflect what the counselor is talking about? I think uh, staff has got the gist of uh, council's conversation here, and if. Uh, we don't implement it according to your desires, I'm sure you'll let us know. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good to me. Okay. Everybody ready to vote? Okay. Let's call the roll then. Councilor Lewis. Aye. Councilor Kayser. Aye. Councilor Anderson. Aye. Councilor Nanke. What are you, Nanke? Aye. Sorry, aye. <laughs> Councilor Leung. Aye. Councilor Osik. Aye. Councilor Hoy. Aye. Councilor Nordyke. Aye. And Mayor Bennett. Aye. Motion passes. Okay. Okay. And excuse me, Mayor, I believe yes. we're going to revisit Councilor Nordyke's uh, motion now. Now? Okay. Very right. good. Councilor Nordyke, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate that. So uh, I move to direct staff to develop diversity, equity, and inclusion training for all city councilors and department heads as part of the new city councilor orientation, which happens, I believe, every two years. Second, Second. by Hoy. OK. We've had a pretty good discussion of this. Mm -hmm. Talk a little more. Just very oh, briefly, okay. and I appreciate that. Um, the reason why I want these three groups of individuals included, new city councilors, um, they need to start their leadership service on the right foot with an equity lens in mind. The fact is Salem is an international city, 90 lang languages spoken in our schools. We have a majority student of color, student body. We have refugees from all over the world here it is time that we recognize the fact that our decisions impact everyone and sometimes in disparate ways. For current city councilors, they need to be included in the training to ensure that everyone is on the same page. And last but not least, and arguably even more important, uh, are the department heads. And that's because a lot of the decisions that are made by the city never come before council. A lot of the decisions that, that shape the recommendations that are brought to council have an impact on our communities. And without that equity lens, there, frankly, decisions can be made that will impact different groups of people in different ways. I think that this is a training that if we start doing it uh, right around the city council orientation each time that happens, that will become slowly but surely a part just baked into our training and baked into the fact that Salem is diversifying and growing and we are richer and stronger for that. And right. how and what that training look like looks like is extremely important. And I've already spoken with uh, at least one individual on how to you know, make sure that that training is actually effective and helpful and it's not just plain paying lip service, it's about creating a sense for a need for change. Until you see a need for change, until you understand it, you won't embrace it. So those are the reasons why I'm making the motion. Okay, Councilor Anderson. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I fully support this. And I go back again to I saying this is an unusual time with, it, it addresses both the issues we're talking about, the, the George Floyd and also the COVID and the, the uh, unequal impact on various communities that are more affected by that. So I think it's a great idea. Okay, anyone else? Okay, if you'd call the roll. Councilor Kayser. Aye. Councilor Anderson. Aye. Councilor Nanke. Aye. Councilor Leung. Aye. Councilor Osik. Aye. 
Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Lewis. Aye. And Mayor Bennett. Aye. Motion passes. Okay. Now to information reports. If I may, quick, Mr. Mayor. Go. Just a, a, a comment on that. And um, we've been going through this in the Watershed Council as well. And I just want to make sure that, and whoever is developing this training, that you look at it from a, a lot of angles. Because from a Watershed Council, when we're doing DEI training, it's not necessarily based on um, different groups, the same as what a lot of people think of when they hear DEI training. And in our case, it's like what impacts or what position inside of the socioeconomic um, watershed council as well. And so it's, it's not just um, communities that we might think of uh, in general. And so we can, we can have narrow training or we can have broad based to where we're actually opening people's minds to think about a lot of things. Um, but a lot of the times when people hear of DEI training, it's we need to make sure um, we're, we're looking at why, why do we not have any um, Latino members on our committee? And that may be because we're not offering some means for, for children who they typically have accompanied them to meetings as well. Yeah. But from a watershed council, we have truly other diversity pieces on how people may be affected. So I just want to make sure that we, we don't narrow, narrowly tailor this to such an extent that, that we're missing out on, on looking at other factions um, that we impact. Because it's I'm, not just based on race or sex or um, nationality as well. Or so yeah, I'm, I'm sure uh, there will be a lot of work done putting these uh, together. I know Councillor Nordyke obviously has strong interest as do uh, I think every other member of the council. So there will be a lot of interest and I'm sure uh, we'll see a, as broad a program as possible. I'm going to move on to information reports. Anyone got any questions on or comments on any of these reports? Councillor Kayser. Thank you. I just wanted to comment quickly on 5.A. This is the YMCA redevelopment. Uh, good to see their their site plan and that uh, site uh, coming coming back to life <laughs> from the the gravel uh, lot it is now. So uh, looking forward to that, seeing that happen. It's really good news for their veterans uh, housing program as well. I think that's that's just really good to see. Anyone else, Councillor Leon? Um, I also wanted to echo um, for for council, like Councillor Kaiser, especially for um, for item 5.A um, for the YMCA plan. I know a lot of community members have been um, anxiously waiting for it to move forward. I mean, I'm a YMCA member too, and I, I really miss being able to go downtown and going to the gym and being around community members that are regulars. I mean, even people who have been members for for years, like sometimes they would they would just sit there and you know, it's it's their space. And yeah. so it's, it's it's good to be able to see um, the progress that it's pursuing. Um, I did have one question. Um, I, I can't find the actual report. It's on the mess of my papers all over here now. Um, my question had to do with um, part of the if I so I'm going to go by memory. Um, it has to do with um, shade trees, I think was one part of the new condition or like a modification of a condition. Um, I believe it probably was addressed before, but I just was wanting to hear from staff what a shade tree might consist of. Norman, uh, are you the shade tree guy on this one? Uh, I'm not, but uh, I think Lisa can help us here so that we get the most accurate information. Lisa, are you available to answer this question for Councillor Leon? Sure, hi, Lisa Anishinaabe, your planning administrator. Um, not the tree expert, really, but our code does differentiate between um, shade trees, so trees that are designed to grow up to a certain height and provide shade over like the sidewalk or parking area, and ornamental trees, which are generally not as tall and they don't have the type of canopy and don't provide that shade. So we do differentiate between those in the code, and you can provide ornamental trees, um, but in certain areas, we want to make sure you have shade trees and a certain percentage of your trees, especially in parking lots and along the sidewalk, we want to be shade trees to provide that shade. Great. 
Does that answer your question, Councillor? Um, kind of, sort of. I was wondering if there was like a certain, like because it's a shade tree, there's only certain trees that could be provided in that instance. And um, a, a follow-up um, question, which I can't remember right now, so I'll follow with you offline. Um. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we do have a list and so there's probably hundreds of varieties of shade trees that they can provide so we don't tell them specifically which type of tree, just that it needs to be a shade tree and it needs to, to fall within that category. Okay. Oh, okay. now I remember what my question is. Sorry, okay. <laughs> last question. Um, so um, as part of the tree canopy or our tree canopy reports are both shade trees and ornamental trees then put into that report or are they, are they only count uh, trees that are shade trees in that actual report that we received? I, I believe it's all trees that are counted, but um, Public Works does that report. And so they would be the experts on that. Oh, Mr. Fernandez pop up on our screen here. What, what, what's the, Good evening, what's the count based on? It's, it's based on the amount of canopy. So we're not counting every tree. We're looking at satellite imagery and taking account of how much of the city is covered by tree canopy. Okay. Public and private trees. Okay, so it's not done by three trees on my block. You're looking more at my block and how much coverage is on it. Is that the concept? I'm, I'm sorry, Mayor. My internet connection is a little unstable. It's and a I dumb question. Never mind. Councillor Anderson has a good one, though. Thank we'll, you. We'll see about that. We'll see about that. Uh, and thank you, Councillor Leong, for bringing this up because uh, I found that on my mess of papers that I had a question, too, and I think it's for Ms. Anderson Ogilvy. This is on uh, 5C, which is the, the decision that discusses trees. I'm looking at condition number seven of that, and it says install tree, street trees along the frontage of the subject property to the maximum extent feasible. And, you know, what does that mean and who <laughs> determines feasibility? Ah, Mr. Fernandez. Yeah, let me assist here if I may. What we have found is uh, that there are often things like driveways and stormwater facilities and utilities, et cetera. So we certainly want to maximize the number of street trees, but we have found when we set an exact amount that we then run into trouble because of all these other conflicts. So uh, I appreciate that very much. So really what you're saying is you folks, the Public Works Department is gonna determine if it's feasible or not. They're gonna to come to you and say, we don't think we can put a tree in here because there's a driveway and a water main and something else and it just won't fit. And you will send somebody out and say, yes, we agree or no, here's another way to put the tree. Yeah. So we want trees, yeah. I'll okay. make up a number every Thank 50 very much. center. Yeah, you know, we've had a little bit going don't. on with trees lately, so thanks. All righty. Any further business for the council? Then we are adjourned.